We first start with some questions to Jordan and to uh, Henry, and, it, and, and the topics that they presented fits very much with the panel discussion, so um, if there are no questions, there, okay, there's a question over there. Angela Lam. Okay. I have a question on the ALT, good fire and, and bad fire. Um, the, the graph you show with um, the PD1, is it any better? Actually, it was a really high increase, right, from um, very low levels to 100 to 200. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, what do you think of that, and how do we monitor that for new, new inhibitors? I mean, I, I agree it's a challenge. So the, the ALT in that patient went up to about 250. So that's about, um, I mean, depending on which upper limit of normal, but I guess it's between five and 10 times the upper limit of normal. If you use the 30 cutoff, it was a male patient. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's a significant flare. I think for most of us in practice without jaundice, we would be pretty comfortable watching a patient like that. But um, certainly if it had gone much higher, that would start to make people nervous. So I, I agree with you that it's really a challenge in, under, in those ALT flares what your comfort is for clinical practice. Because if, if something is effective but it requires a lot of monitoring, um, it's going to make clinicians nervous to use the therapy. And the concern, of course, is that that isn't 250, but it's 2250, and there's, there's jaundice, which could have happened as well. So I don't know, if Henry, if you want to, or anyone else wants to comment. Yeah, I think if you use an immune-moderating drug, AOT flare is almost unavoidable. Um, the, the, the issue is the magnitude of flare and the safety of the flare. So, well, one thing, of course, we, we try not to recruit uh, say, advanced fibrotic patient in the study, so even as a very serious flare, it is uh, more safe. And number two would be to test um, uh, clearly the, hepat the, the liver toxicity probably in a very early phase studies. Because if it is daily, then um, you should be able to see some signals of AOT elevation in non-happy patients because it's happy unrelated. So when you see this, then of course you'll be very, very careful to think about whether you should move on or not. But if you see nothing in your, in your healthy volunteers, but you see something, at least in early phase, of happy patients, they're more likely to be virus-related type of flare. <coughs> then we have to think about whether it is a, a, a so-called good flare. And other um, signal that can help us is the decline of HPV DNA in relationship to the AOT. Because normally, a good flare, the AOT flare should, should be accompanied by a reduction of HPV DNA, sometimes also by a reduction of HPSAG. So this, again, will tell us that this is a good flare. But, but this patient was nuke suppressed, right? Yeah. I have a question, actually, to the two gentlemen the far left, both coming from industrial partners, because the last two talks were on uh, innovative trial design and combination of treatment and, and the minefield uh, we're in. And you guys talk with the FDA regularly. So, how? What is your approach on moving forward in in general with these with the company? You both have a rather broad portfolio of different drugs. How do you do it? I think we both approach it from a, a similar way, actually. I mean, because we, we we both benefited from being involved in the in the hepatitis C side, and before that, I was on the HIV side doing the same thing with combination work. So, I, I completely agree with what Jordan and Henry you know talked about today. Clearly. A, a, a rule that we always had was that any drug we put in combination, this goes back to, to, to Pharmacet and the same thing at Gilead, that we had to be comfortable with the safety of that individual drug. Because when, we, when you start having two or three of your own drug together in a combination, you risk destroying your entire portfolio in one fell swoop if, if, you, uh, if you don't understand what you're doing. A prime example of that was, was at Pharmacet, actually. You may not remember, but we had a study called the Quantum Study. Mm -hmm. which was a big study of two nukes together. And we did a 14-day study, and everything was perfect. Every, every, everything was great. If you looked at the toxicology early on, there were no overlapping toxicologies. We didn't have to do combination tox. So we launched into a, uh, I think it was like an eight-arm study where we looked at different combinations of these two drugs. Luckily, they were also arms where we didn't have both drugs in them. And, and what we found was that as soon as we got out to about three to four weeks of dosing, about 30% of the patients who got the one drug 938 had ALT elevations, 
which were anywhere from three to five to, to, to higher times the upper limit of normal. But luckily, they only occurred in the arms that had 938. And, and we immediately put that study on hold and called FDA. And, and they, they were, they, they initially thought we were being too conservative. And then we explained yeah. <laughs> what we were seeing again. And, and they, uh, they ultimately agreed. But, but the lesson there, again, is make sure that the, the safety data you have on your individual drugs is enough. And in that case, you know, we didn't follow our own rule. We didn't have 12 weeks of safety data on the second drug because that was the bar that we applied when we looked at doing studies with other companies' drugs, because we did studies with Decladosphere, we did studies with Semeprevir, and we always told the other companies that they had 12 weeks. But in our case, we didn't follow our own, our own rule, and, and uh, that's what happened. But luckily, we had a clean signal for Savaldi, so there was never a question that Savaldi was causing it. We were able to, 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 to pin it on the other drug because of data. Anuj, you want to comment? Yeah, I think um, so. Of course, I completely agree with you, Bill. And uh, what we've tried to do also is uh, not to jump into very large studies very quickly, especially when you have two combination agents or two immune modulators. I think it's really risky to do that. And as an example, the PD-1 study, even the design of that study was not to put all the patients in together and give them a dose. It was two sentinel patients getting the lowest dose following safety two more patients getting the higher dose, following the safety on that, then exposing um, 10 patients to the PD-1 alone before going into the vaccine plus PD-1. So there was a stepwise approach, I think. So small cohorts, sentinel cohorts are things that we can do to try to make sure we are doing things as safely as possible. We I mean, have to take some, we can't know all the data before we go in, but I think we need to just make smart decisions when we're doing those trials. Because I think the individual agent safety is the first step. The second step is doing this combo in a smart way. Fabien, you, you talked about um, partial response. So we, we had this meeting in, uh, in Alexandria like a year ago, and the endpoints were defined. And I mean, there's a lot of discussion whether S loss is the best, but I think the consensus is yes, it is. And, 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 um, but then these companies in their phase two studies, <clears throat> they would have to, they can rely on like the partial response. So was that defined in more detail? What, what is a partial response? And um, um, how can we use that to move on with a specific drug, uh, whether it's an immune modulator or an, an antiviral drug? There was no uh, precise definition uh, regarding, <laughs> regarding partial cure. The, the idea was to, um, to, to discuss or, or, or consider the fact that um, having uh, a functional cure as a, as a primary endpoint for, let's say, the early phase clinical trials w would put the bar way too high. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to, to say, can we consider having an in intermediate uh, uh, endpoint so that we can envision this clinical development uh, in a stepwise manner? Obviously, it depends on the mode of action of your, uh, of your drug. If you have a, a drug that is uh, targeting directly HBS, you, you, you need to see uh, something uh, right away, otherwise your mode of action is, is questionable. Uh, if you're not targeting directly HBS antigen, then um, the, uh, the, the idea, the concept of having a partial cure uh, is interesting because you, you could see uh, already um, um, an effect in the early phase that would tell us that the drug is indeed doing something, mm -hmm. uh, and then we can move forward to, to the next steps. So then the question is, is there a, a given threshold for HBS, um, or a given uh, magnitude of decline of HBS? Uh, and this is really, I mean, we don't know. I mean, that's the, yeah. uh, the <laughs> that's a problem, because we, 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 don't, we never had the tools in hand. Exactly. Uh, so so we, are, we are building the story uh, um, all together, actually. Maybe, you know, functional cure at the end is S antigen loss. So we have been using S antigen loss as a target for hepatitis B therapy in the last 20 years. So this is not really a new endpoint. It's just a new name for the usual endpoint, not to make people confusing very much. And this is really what we call in the guidelines phase five of the natural history. So S antigen negative, anti-core positive. Sometimes it's called occult hepatitis, sometimes it's called resolved hepatitis, sometimes it's called past infection. So at the end, uh, just to make things maybe clear, 
we are all, this, this, tech, this uh, definition, functional cure, is really, again, putting together all the other definitions. It's not a new phase. It's just a phase five of the natural history. And if you go to partial cure, my understanding, maybe I'm wrong, is these are inactive carriers. Inactive carriers with undetectable DNA, which is not 100% inactive carriers, is a subpopulation of inactive carriers, which is phase three. So again, we are using a different name to what I've been using and seeing in the last 20 years for any, basically, therapy. So this is just to try to, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but this was my understanding. You, you're right, but the, the idea is um, to, to really give an, um, a goal. Uh, and uh, the goal is to, to have more patients go, going into these phases. Uh, um, so uh, we call it a, a cure because we are treating patients, uh, but uh, we agree that these would be uh, kind of inactive carriers uh, induced by treatment, uh, short-term treatment, and, uh, uh, and HBS clearance, so phase five, if you, if you, if you wish, but, but induced by treatment. So the, the name of cure is, is important to, to guide therapy. Now, now, another point, I mean, that may, if you want to, to, to have an agree, it's just could be some semantic thing, but in the end, it's not only semantic, it's really to guide the clinical development. There, something that could completely change and be innovative if we had, and this was discussed this morning, uh, novel biomarkers that would be strong enough and robust enough um, to uh, predict the, uh, the cure, whether it's partial cure or, 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 or functional cure, because then this could assist the, the uh, clinical development and we could say in phase, even in phase 1B, say, hey, uh, this drug is doing something on this biomarker and we, and we know that this biomarker is predictive uh, of HBS clearance. So then you, you're, you know that you're on the right track or, or vice versa, you don't see anything on this biomarker, then you say, hey, this, we, we have to forget about this drug. But and, we, and we the, don't have uh, these biomarkers so far. We say they, they, are, uh, they are of potential interest, but they are not robust enough so far. Because on the other hand, you, have, you might have the problem that a company has a drug which works well on HP core related antigen or HBV RNA is, and they say, well, this is, this is the drug of the future. And the problem is we don't really have, those are not like what we call typical surrogate markers for heart, and heart outcomes. So we don't know, we, we cannot correlate yet, uh, far from, I would say, correlated antigen to less liver cancer. Or what, so that is the, that, that is the problem of the whole thing, that in these phase two studies, these, the companies might say, well, this is very good for this specific marker, and therefore we move on with development. Yet we don't even know whether this specific marker is improving the outcome of hepatitis B, right? So I think to, to, it's good to move to S antigen loss, as, as, uh, and if that marker is indicative to get S antigen loss, hopefully that will be fine, but it is, uh, it is complicated. Any thoughts or comments uh, from the audience on this? Can I just ask, yeah. um, I see Marla Maney still in the audience over there. Can I just get a microphone over to uh, Professor Marla Maney? <laughs> Marla, what, what I'd like to ask you is, that, you know, we're talking a lot about viral biomarkers. Um, can the immunologists provide us with some sort of immune recovery marker? Can, can pharmaceutical companies say that if I drop my surface antigen by one or two logs and I see X, Y and Z immunologically, is that a meaningful endpoint? We didn't really have haven't really brought the immunologists into the, out of the shadows into the limelight. <laughs> well, you have, you have asked this question repeatedly, and we just don't still have the answer, but I think what we need to do is more um, of these type of studies on the back of, uh, of the existing you know, drug trials. So if we could, for example, Pietro's suggestion that we, we look at HPV-specific T cells and a certain threshold is a good indication for then going ahead with a, an immune modulator like a vaccine. Uh, but we just need to start incorporating these things into some of the mm -hmm. existing drug trials, which have so already put off because they thought to be too difficult, but hopefully we're getting to the point where we can do that. Yeah, I mean, in the absence now of a requirement for a liver biopsy, either before or at the end of, it's quite hard now to sort of basically capture everything in a peripheral blood sample, whether it be PBMCs or uh, or serum or plasma. So is there something in the PBMC compartment that you, you see that would reliably 
or, or indicate to you that you're heading in the you know the drugs heading in the right direction um, I mean I suppose the best bet at the moment would just be HBV specific T cell frequencies T but I would personally favor doing uh, these discovery trials should really include liver sampling even if it's a fine needle aspirate rather than a biopsy and then as um, as Gil pointed out if we have, go through a period of doing that intensively hopefully we'll get to the point where we then can find a better biomarker in the periphery which does reflect what's going on in the liver but I think for the early stages we, we really should be sampling the liver there's much better chance of finding out mm. what's going on uh, Mala my understanding was that although it's very difficult to check for T cell recovery markers, it's, it's my understanding that it's much easier to check for NK phenotype. And we have shown with Carlo Ferrari that the NK phenotype is exactly the opposite of the uh, T uh, cell recovery uh, pattern. So my understanding, but this is not really my job, is that my uh, <laughs> measuring the NK profile during long-term oral therapy, you can have a very sort of rather good assessment of the T cell recovery function. Is yeah, that yeah. true? Is that, that feasible? That's, that's Is that easy? Yeah, or? I think that that's from very preliminary data that does look encouraging. Um, it's a much simpler thing to do because it's just, you know, it'd be like doing a CD4 count for an HIV trial. Um, it would just be a simple one panel mm. phenotypic stain. Um, but we need to look at it in, in a bit more <coughs> patients, I think, to see if it holds out. So actually, in the um, new B trial that I'm part of in, in the UK, where we're doing a treatment interruption with or without pegylated interferon, we'll be looking at that to see if it's going to hold out as a, as a biomarker. But so, yeah, good suggestion. We missed the talk, unfortunately, from Marion Peter. So I think we should talk about individualized therapy as well. And uh, I'd like to ask Henry. John, who has a lot of experience with different treatments and has a huge patient population, to what extent do you think that we should really individualize, particularly, and, and, and how feasible is that also with the new compounds coming around? Ultimately, I don't know whether we need to individualize, and if we really have a very good treatment regimen, the better treatment regimen is that we do not need to individualize. Well, ultimately, well, you, you can always say that the individualization may not be on a choice of drug, for the duration of drug, but this is very difficult to even have C uh, uh, treatment. I'm sure some patient can be, can be treated for a short duration of time, but it's just a matter of probability whether uh, you accept this probability. So I think in the development phase, I will try not to individualize, um, but I would stratify patients in the different disease groups because these patients may respond differently. Like, uh, patient in the immune tolerance phase or E-positive chronic infection, they may respond differently to those with active hepatitis. And obviously, new suppressed versus treatment naive or untreated, they will respond differently. So I will stratify in this way, instead of real individualization of um, treatment. Jordan, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, there, there's a certain level of attractiveness to personalizing it because you, especially with the complexity of HEPI with all the phases and different endpoints, that you might choose different therapies for, for, for different people. But I, I will say, again, looking back at Hep C as a model, there was initially this idea to try to personalize it and really the, the trend has been to move away from that because to try to expand therapy when you start to really think about access as being an issue and treating the number of patients that you need to treat, simplification probably trumps personalization. But I think you need to, in HEP B, we're so, so much further back in terms of understanding what therapies will work in different groups. So we, you may start with personalization and then try to simplify it and collapse groups into one another, I think. Yeah. Uh, is there, because, yeah, I tend to agree with that. And I mean, sometimes companies want to focus their drug on a very small sub population of patients and you think well there, there's no generalizability and to what extent is that still um, is that smart to do do you have a comment uh, yeah I, I had a, a comment regarding this uh, individualization of treatment uh, um, you, you might consider two, two, two aspects one is the uh, uh, patient population that we, we, we want to target, and you may, may have different strategies uh, depending on the uh, patient profile. But there's also the, um, 
uh, the, uh, the um, uh, aspect when you, you're in combination therapy in terms of sequence of treatments. So should we also individualize the, uh, the sequence of treatment? Uh, when to, the question is when to combine, add uh, uh, a checkpoint inhibitor, when to, to add uh, uh, a TLR agonist or a, a therapeutic vaccine, um, um, should it be before at the same time of a direct antiviral and, and, and so on. I mean, so that would, this, these are, I think, very interesting questions because we, we don't have the right uh, preclinical model, yeah. I believe. I think it's good to ask this. A uh, question to Bill and Anuchis, because they deal with this on a, on a daily basis, uh, <laughs> almost. How, how, you, how do you deal with that? Do you mainly focus, for instance, on E-positive or E-negative patients? Uh, how, how do you, and, and with individualizing? Yeah, so uh, I, I think you could call it individualizing, or you could call it enriching the population in the study <laughs> to, uh, to try and produce an effect which is, which is more informative for the drug. So, I mean, the, the, the way I think about it is clearly you don't want to mix populations that should be kept separate. I mean, that's why you, I think every company does separate studies in E-negative cohorts, E-positive cohorts. And, and, you know, when you're in the phase two part as well, it's really good to try and learn as much as you can about prognostic factors for response for of within a population of patients, again, to continue honing in on the group that's most likely to benefit and not keep studying the group that clearly isn't going to benefit because if, if, if you go out in the broad population and, and your drug is effective in 20% of the patients, why keep doing that when you can have 100% of the population respond if you identify who those people are? So I, I think that that's maybe just a different way to look at it. And I think the FDA is very open to that. I mean, we see this across a number of different disease areas where enriching the population for success, especially early on, and then expand later once you understand why or perhaps another subpopulation you understand just needs a more potent DNA replication inhibitor or something, so you, you can then tailor that way. And I think the combination therapy paradigm is going to allow us to do that because, again, if, especially if you're a company with a big portfolio that has a lot of different tools, you, you'll be able to mix and match and add in. And I think that, that, that companies are, I mean, I, I, in, 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 in hepatitis C, I, I think was maybe the, it was maybe the least intercompany collaborative. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 HIV got that way, but that was because of ACTG. Yeah. And then there were a lot of forces at play there. And I think on hepatitis B, like was said earlier, there are a lot of smaller companies that have single drugs that know that they have to work with other companies. So, so I think that people are very open to that. I, I've never heard anyone stand up at a meeting and say they're not going to work with other companies. So okay. we'll assume everybody is. Yeah. Anuj? Yeah, I think one of the challenges is um, we, we look to the past to try to predict the future of who's the responder, who, what predicts response. And there's a danger in that because we only have the things that have been tested, nukes and interferon. And to try to apply that summarily across the new agents, there's a danger. So if we knew the ease to treat population, we would, of course, focus on that, use that as a signal and move on. But I think we'd like to be broad in the approach right now and not say that we know a priori, which is a population that's going to benefit the most, and try to do focused experiments to explore multiple populations. And then, as Bill said, once you see the signal, then really go more into that group to try to identify it. But I think we will benefit from being broad in the approach up front, but having the markers that, Bill, you talk about, which is being able to distinguish populations that are going to benefit early in treatment um, so that we, because I think, you know, we, we we can do great studies that take a very long time to address fundamentally every question that we want, but we'll be here forever trying to do that. So the question is, where do we take the risk? Because the risks are in doing novel agents quickly without safety data. I think that's a risk we don't want to take. Then the risk is, can we find the right biomarkers and work on that aspect to really find, when we do our combo studies of molecules early on in discrete populations, how do we pick a winner early? That's our challenge. And I think if we focus on that aspect, we'll all probably go farther faster. The question that Pietro asked earlier about the genetic predictors, I, I think if we got better at identifying like clear biomarkers, I mean, Bill talked about E positive, E negative, that's really easy to measure, but you need a really clear biomarker to define it. And unfortunately, even our phases of disease are too, a bit too variable. We're not always sure if someone's ex exiting immune tolerance to immune activity, and there's a lot of noise around that, but the better we get at identifying really responsiveness and the biologic determinants of that, I think we'll be better at tailoring therapy and then understanding therapy. We didn't talk a lot, lot about hepatitis delta today. Um, 
the Merkler Dex data are in Delta, so that's, that was brought up. So to what extent are we pursuing this? And uh, sometimes it's a nice, let's say, bystander. If you have a drug which happens to work for Delta as well, and then it's used for that, basically. Um, to what extent should we pursue that? What is the market for it? What is the, what are the odds? Well, I'll, maybe I'll start. So I think th the clinical need is clear, and I think that there's no doubt that it, it needs to be addressed. And we're very happy to see, like Mark Cludex and others, really tackling this issue. Um, I think we have to also focus as a company and figure out how you want to use your abilities and resources the best. And for us, we're focused on HPV cure because we feel if we do that, we have cured Delta in the process. And so instead of trying to, um, at this point with, our, with what we have, instead of trying to dilute um, our attention too much, we say let's try to get B cured first. And then of course Delta is probably first thing on the list to, to, to apply it to. I think where Delta, the value of Delta is that the need is so much greater that the types of therapies that might be tolerated from a regulatory perspective or from a patient perspective are different than, as Pietro will often remind us, the patients who are doing very well on, with hepatitis B on nukes. So that's, that's one, one interesting aspect of Delta, but so far that's not the, cure, the absolute focus for us. Mm -hmm. I would just add to that. I, I agree with everything Anu said, and, and I would just add that you know, like with the technology like siRNA, that's clearly a place where, where, where you could probably make an impact on Delta as well. Yeah. I just want to make one aspect that we really should take more and more into account with Delta. These are e many of them are e antigen negative patients. From my impression that I have, Delta can replicate without having any CCC DNA to say very drastic. Mm -hmm. uh, so it might replicate in S antigen expressing cells that have nothing to do with HPV anymore. So we are not always aware of mm -hmm. that. It requires, of course, HPV, but it requires it at an early stage. And therefore, unless we have a curative therapy that really reduces or abolishes S, I think we should really take care of Delta if we have the possibility. I mean, there are three drugs developed for Delta, which are, which is nice, yeah? We, 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 but, but I think we really took, should take that serious that even if we have very good drugs that eliminate CCC DNA, we have not solved the problem with Delta. Yeah? And tenophobia, so at least in the arm, is not doing uh, anything on, on Delta replication uh, at all. So it should take the series. And, and with 20 million, and we should look for, for the Delta uh, patients. In the US, I don't know whether you know how many Delta patients there are. I mean, you don't test them. In China, we don't know how many Delta patients there are, but there might be five to six or seven percent of all of them that, uh, that are HPV positive. So I think without having a treatment option, I don't know about, much about the markets. We should really take care of, of, of Delta, yeah? independent of HPV. And we learn a lot. We really will learn a lot on Delta. If we, uh, if we are doing also, for example, we have, we have tested one, one drug that's assuming to, to go for delta in a screen, and we found something that is affecting S secretion, because this is an indirect effect that you can see. So delta is a very good model from a molecular biology point of view, also to find something for HPV that we even didn't ex uh, expect, just as some as well. So Stefan, can we just clarify about the integrated state providing the envelope for delta, or the rescue envelope for delta? Uh, does it only need S, or do you need to have a bit of L as well? The, the problem that you get, for example, in those th uh, analysis of patients' data that we are doing now and we presented the hitting meeting there, you have some very uh, funny or interesting discrepancy between the viral load that mm -hmm. you have in the patients and the reduction of viral load and the infectivity of the serum. Because there are obviously some delta that is completely maybe packaged into S. They, you can measure them in the serum, but yeah. they are not infectious. They're not infectious. Yeah. So, uh, so it depends on the rearrangement, probably, of the integrate and how much of S only, coming to Florian's talk, yeah, uh, uh, and the individual patients. Yeah. So, but the of course, for Delta, you only need S, but yeah. then you don't have to, uh, But the important thing is that even with S, you get disease. Yeah, that, of course, yeah. if you reduce the S secretion, of course, you, you reduce the Delta particle sure. secretion as well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Fabian. Yeah. I actually had a question regarding Delta to, to Bill because um, so you have um, siRNAs that uh, uh, were shown to decrease HBS level. So have, 
So have you tried to, uh, or have you envisioned to do a, a clinical trial in Delta-infected patients? And the second question is, have you envisioned to um, target um, a Delta with uh, siRNA? Mm -hmm. So targeting the uh, um, viral RNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I would say that, that, that in seeing the data we generated so far, we've clearly talked about Delta and the possibility to do something in Delta. We, we haven't planned a specific study as of yet, but, but, but definitely are, are discussing it internally, and we have not pursued a path of a specific product for Delta, given where 1467 is now. I mean, Fabian, just to help, help with your question, um, Arrowhead did uh, enroll some Delta patients in their um, cohort 8 study, and they were all the antigen negative with low HPV DNA viral loads, and uh, the Delta RNA is being studied at the moment, but uh, that data will be presented probably at ESL. Okay. It, it, it didn't make it for the ASLD, but um, um, so, it's, so there is a cohort that have been treated with RNAi, so it will be interesting to look. Okay, I, then I want to, it's almost five, to go to the multi-million dollar question that I also asked last year. Like, and I would like to start on the right side, and uh, I don't think that St Stefan and myself are only chairperson, so we don't have to answer this, but, and then I'll, and, I'll, and I'll give the guys on the left some time to think about it. If you would have to pick three drugs, to move on and get functional cure. What would you do, Fabian? Well, Use you, the you, microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Three quarters. So it just was a one million, so, so, yeah. so it has to, it has to be off record. Huh? Um, OK, um, well, you, you don't have too many, actually, uh, that, that you, you could Well, let, I'm talking about classes of drugs, right? <laughs> so it's not, uh, not about registered drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, yeah. sure. But even those that are in, uh, uh, in clinical development, I mean, it's, um, so you've, <laughs> So you have to, to see the, the mode of action, the, uh, the safety, um, time, duration of, uh, um, of treatment, and so on. Ah. <laughs> Difficult, huh? Um, <laughs> um, um, let's say you, 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 you come with an entry inhibitor, a capsid modulator. Um, well, you, you have siRNA, the HB, the, the NAP, the NAP for uh, that's uh, three. It, so and that's only four. three. <laughs> any any immune modulator? Any any immune direct immune modulator? I would say, or not not yet. So far, I'm 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 not really convinced by the uh, the immune modulator. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't go for it, but. Um, I mean, the, the recent uh, results were, were not that great. I mean, okay. we, we have to, uh, to admit All that. Right. So, so we still need more studies so that, to, that immune modulators could, could come back in, in the game. Uh, I think they are a little bit back okay. uh, today. So All I right. would combine several, um, s several DAs. Okay, that's a very diplomatic French answer, so let's go to Italy. <laughs> You know, we are always very diplomatic in Italy. <laughs> so I will just confirm Fabien's thoughts. He is a super virologist, super clinician, so of course I would agree with him. Uh, so really, I think it's very early. Immunomodulators, I agree with Fabien. That's potentially very interesting. But so far, we did not see anything major. New immunomodulators will be available, but we'll see. Um, uh, really, nothing really major. Again, I think it's a little bit too early. <laughs> Even 2017. Stefan, want to comment on it? Or yeah, it's fine. Look, I think um, you know, um, St Stefan Urban gave a bit of a clue today. I think I agree that you, know, you need something to protect reinfection. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very important model that you're developing, Stefan, that you can actually protect the newly uh, made hepatocytes from uh, infection. And oh, am I, am I not talking in the right? <laughs> oh, okay. One, 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 one nasal escapes enough. Um, but I, I'm not so sure I agree with your, your choice of capsid inhibitor because the capsid inhibitor, <clears throat> I think, so far have proven a little bit disappointing the lack of their effect on surface antigen. And so I would then combine a uh, entry inhibitor like Mecludex with an RNAi inhibitor. But even in the virologist in me, in my bones, I know we need a little bit of immune stimulation. And I think the rig eye agonists that have been, will be presented this week at AASLD from um, Springbank it's the first convincing evidence I've seen where um, something positive can happen from an um, immune modulator in the current um, 
sort of stable of drugs. So I'd go with McCludex, um, an RNAi inhibitor, next generation, and I think the, the latest one from um, Arbutus looks pretty promising, their new one, and, and, and a rig eye agonist. I, I think, I, I mean, I like the idea of the of s s sort of direct viral inhibition, protein inhibition, and then I would say a gentle immune stimulant, which I think the, and, 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 and I, 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 but I would actually say that the TLR agonist and the, and the rig eye agonist, that, that on, on the innate side, even though it's more nonspecific, I think it's um, likely to be less, well, it's less likely to lead to severe flares, I think. I mean, I'm not sure that's true, but that's, so that's uh, where. The, the rig eye actually is the five prime epsilon. Yeah. So it's, it's, it shows really, really, you know, sort of elegant specificity. Specific, you mean? It's specific for Hep B, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, well, PAMP, the, the, the pathogen associated molecular pathogen uh, yeah. pattern is actually the 5 prime epsilon. Uh, but, but still, just stimulating rig I will lead to down, I mean, to, to just IRF3 stimulation and, yeah. and interferon production, even, well, you, you even need, independent you do, you do of Hep B. Yeah. But I mean, the, the I initial, know, the, the initial yeah. driver is specific. Right, but, it, yeah. but it's okay. I won't argue. We, we need um, a drug that can block. Uh, well, all open reading frames very potently. Right now, it seems that uh, RNA is one of the option, uh, but it's not oral drug, so it's not ideal. Uh, uh, Capsitamine is again is very weak against S antigen, so may not be too good. But we need one drug like this, and then another drug will be immune stimulation. Uh, actually, I I'm got a little bit of insight from one of the recent paper of treating inactive carriers with PAC interferon and we use 40 something percent as loss in after two years of treatment. So apparently if we can drive a patient into that inactive state and then further stimulate the immune system to clear the remaining virus laden cells, then it might be a way to achieve cure. But we really need very potent uh, NRL drugs, not just to block the polymerase, but probably in more open reading frames. Bill? Yes, yeah, so I, uh, I would take an enriched population, and I would, I'd probably, I, I would, I would want to have a nuke, so tenofovir or TAF. I'd want to have the RNAi and then interferon, because that's what I can access today. So, if if you want to see what you can do with the two the tools that are available, that's the option you have. And I think then it comes down to picking the right pa patient population to, uh, to fully evaluate that combination, see what happens. If you have success, then you can back off, and then you can figure out why and then expand. But, but if it doesn't work in the enriched population, then I think that tells you a lot. And if you would have to choose from drugs which are not available yet? Drugs in, in, that are not available in, in, yet? In development, I would say, or do, do you Yes, so, uh, that? you know, the, the, there's a lot of capsid inhibitors. I think Angela was, was right, you know, we, we need more more potent capsid inhibitors, and I think that those are coming. I'm intrigued by that mechanism, but it just hasn't, it hasn't panned out. I'm going to take a nuke any day if I want to suppress DNA at, at, at the present time. And then uh, I think there's a lot of cool stuff on the horizon, the TLR8 program, I think Sting programs. There's uh, the, the Rig Eye. I, I like the Rig Eye too, but uh, it just remains to be seen once we get the safety data and then understand not only the dose to use, but also when to use it. Because it might be that you want to use the, S and the, uh, the RNAi to drive S antigen down to, say, live below 500, and mm -hmm. then add something else in. Or, you know, that there could be some real nuances to the pattern of how you actually treat these patients. Okay. Anuj? Um, I'll go aspirational. So I think uh, a nuke, I think a nuke is an important backbone for patients. Um, I think if we can get an HBX inhibitor, that would be really fantastic. And I think one where we have an oral way to do really reducing all transcripts and transcription. So, and it's a viral target. So for me, that's a very exciting, though a very difficult um, challenge, of course. And then I also like the gentle immune stimulation. I think I'd like to see more adaptive immune stimulation, though. So potentially, uh, I think our data with PD-1 was interesting and intriguing. And I think it's the question of how can you do that um, Gently, <laughs> but I think that would be an ideal combo for me. No CCD, DNA. no targeting. Oh yeah, CCD targeting. Well, well, we'll check up on next year's prediction and see how how we can. Be. It's all been recorded, so we can back check. <laughs> so uh, please uh, join with me in thanking the panel for a stimulating afternoon's discussion, and uh, you're free to go. <laughs> <laughs>